Hello guys, welcome to our first lecture in the series where we will be discussing some basic concepts in organic chemistry. These are the concepts uh, around which most of the or whole of the organic chemistry revolves. But this series is definitely going to be very helpful for college and university students. These are some of the books uh, from which you can take help in understanding these basic concepts in organic chemistry. So you can go and read Organic Chemistry by Francis Carey, uh, Organic Chemistry by Jerry March, it's sixth edition, it's pretty good, and uh, Organic Chemistry by Paula Proust, it's fourth edition. Uh, apart from this, you can also find some other books uh, where you can find basic organic chemistry and the basic concepts of uh, organic chemistry. So we're going to start off uh, with the concept of chemical bonding and that is the basics of uh, uh, chemistry um, actually uh, and we will also discuss its relevance to organic uh, chemistry. But before going on to chemical bonding, let's start from the very basics. So we will start off with atomic structure. How atoms look like. And most of these things you would already know, but I just want you uh, to start or I want to take uh, I want to take you from the very basics and then build upon these uh, concepts uh, for the lectures for the videos to come so an atom has a nucleus in the center and this nucleus has protons and neutrons in it now each element has different number of protons or neutrons in the nucleus and that is what differentiates the atoms of a particular element from the atoms of another element. And then we have orbitals around this nucleus which are occupied by electrons. Remember, protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. We're not going into details of uh, these uh, uh, nuclear particles or electrons but this is just to uh, uh, give you an idea how uh, an atom looks like and how we are going to proceed uh, with this series of lectures. So protons and neutrons are present in the nucleus and electrons revolve around this uh, nucleus in specific uh, paths which we call the orbitals and again elements uh, different elements have different number of electrons in their uh, atomic structure. Remember, neutral atoms have equal number of protons and electrons. Protons are positively charged, electrons are negatively charged. So an equal number of proton and neutron uh, and electron means that there is no net charge on the atom. Neutrons are neutral, so the number of neutrons doesn't really matter uh, when we talk about the overall charge on a particular atom. It's only the protons, the number of protons and electrons uh, which matter when we talk about the charge on a particular atom. And this uh, point or this concept is going to be very helpful in the uh, uh, next topic that we're going to discuss in a couple of minutes. So every element is then characterized by a specific number and that number is known as its atomic number. And this atomic number is represented by the letter Z. So how can we determine or calculate or know the atomic number of an element? This is actually the number of protons in the nucleus or the number of electrons revolving around a nucleus in a particular atom uh, of an element. 
And again, because a neutral atom should have equal number of protons and electrons, so it doesn't really matter if you uh, take the number of protons as the atomic number or the number of electrons as the atomic number, because both would be a similar quantity. Now, what are orbitals? Remember, orbitals do not have a physical existence. I'll tell you uh, in a couple of minutes time what orbitals actually mean. So let's take this from a historical uh, perspective. So you know, electrons, they were considered as particles until 1924, when Louis de Broglie at that time suggested that electrons could also behave like waves. So from that period onwards, electrons were thought to have a dual nature. So they acted as particles and they also behaved like waves. Later on, another scientist, Owen Schrodinger, calculated the energies of electrons in a particular atom. And he did the, this by using the wave nature of these electrons. He did not take into account the particle nature, but actually he considered the wave nature of electrons and calculated their energies. But he did not get similar energies for all the electrons in a particular atom. In fact, he obtained different energy levels. So these electrons present in the atoms did not have similar energies, but they had different energies. Each or these energy levels corresponded to a different mathematical description of that particular electron wave. So if we take each electron as a wave, it has a particular mathematical descriptor or mathematical function behind it and that actually uh, then gives it gives it this this particular electron a particular energy or energy level and these energy levels were later known as orbitals and he called these energy levels Schrodinger called them as wave functions they are represented as psi this, sig, this sign here and later they were known as orbitals. So now you know that orbitals do not have physical existence. In fact, it is just an energy level of an electron wave, of an electron actually in a particular atom. Now, how do these orbitals look like? What are the shapes of these orbitals? You know, from Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, you know that we cannot exactly tell the position of an electron in an atom. So what we can tell actually? We can determine the probability of finding an electron. And that probability of finding an electron is denoted by psi square. Psi, you already know, is the wave function. So the square of that wave function is actually the probability of finding an electron around a particular nucleus. And the region where the probability of finding an electron is maximum is known as the orbital. So these electrons, they revolve around the nucleus. They move around the nucleus in particular paths, in a particular fashion. And that movement of electron actually gives these orbitals the shapes. Orbital now you know is just an energy level where the probability or it is the region where the probability of finding electron 
is maximum. So we have uh, these orbitals or energy level having different shapes just because of their different wave functions. So they behave differently because they have different energies, they have different wave functions, the movement of electron in a particular energy level is different and that is why we say that they have different shapes. So we have basically four different types of orbitals which you already know are denoted as S, P, D and F. Each of them have different shapes. For example, S has a spherical shape and P has a dumbbell shape. And similarly, D and F have different shapes. The shape again means the movement of an electron. The path that uh, an electron carves out when it moves around the nucleus is actually an orbital and that path is the shape of that uh, orbital. Now before understanding how orbitals look like you should know that each of these orbitals they can be subdivided into suborbitals. So S orbital has one suborbital, P has three suborbitals, D has five and F has seven and each of these suborbitals can occupy uh, can be occupied by two electrons so an s orbital can have a maximum of two electrons p because it has three suborbitals can have six electrons two in each of the suborbitals d can have 10 electrons and f can accommodate 14 electrons in total. Now let's see how these orbitals uh, look like. So we have this three-dimensional uh, coordinates x, y and z axis. Now if we talk about the s orbital it has a spherical shape so it is evenly distributed uh, within the three uh, coordinates x, y and z it looks like uh, this uh, spherical ball and it means that the electrons present in an s orbital will move in a spherical uh, way in a spherical path p orbital because uh, you already know it has a dumbbell shape so again if we draw the three axes and remember, uh, as I have told you earlier, this p orbital can have three suborbitals, and these three suborbitals are oriented uh, in the uh, three uh, coordinates uh, in different ways. So one could be oriented along the x-axis, other uh, the second along the y-axis, and the third along the z-axis. So we will uh, see their shapes separately. So if we have a px orbital, now px means that it's a p orbital, suborbital, which is oriented along the x-axis. And you see the dumbbell shaped. So it has two lobes and in the center it has a node. Node is an area right in the center of these two lobes. These are the two lobes. And between them is a node which you can't see here but node is an area where the probability of finding electron is minimum so this px orbital can have electrons and the lobes suggest that the probability of finding electron is maximum in these lobes and it is minimum at the node so node is right in the center of the three uh, coordinates and the two lobes are uh, aligned along x-axis and the minus x-axis. Then we have the py orbital. So again, the two lobes of this dumbbell py orbital will be oriented along the y-axis and the minus y-axis. So one of the lobes will be on the y-axis and the other will be 
on the minus y axis you can draw it in this way and again in the center it has a node which uh, has uh, almost zero probability of uh, finding an electron again the lobes have the maximum uh, probability of finding electron and then finally we have the pz orbital and you can see that the two lobes of this p orbital are oriented along the z axis so this is how uh, you can look at these uh, orbitals now, these orbitals are actually involved in bond formation in one way or the other so this chemical bonding uh, which we will be discussing in a couple of minutes time uh, can be of different types and it is these orbitals the s p d and f orbitals which are involved in bond formation so it was important to know about the orbitals first and now we will be uh, discussing the chemical bond so what are the different types of chemical bonds but before uh, uh, dealing with the types of chemical bonds let's see what a chemical bond is so chemical bond can simply be defined as attractive force between atoms it is the force which binds two atoms together so chemical bond is the attractive force between two atoms now why would two atoms form a bond what compels them to form a bond between themselves with each other and that is the driving force is the completion of the octet of each of these atoms involved in formation of a bond octet completion means that they attain the electronic configuration of the noble gases noble gases you know they have eight electrons in the valence shell and so they are quite inert uh, uh, when you look at the periodic table that is the inert most group in the periodic table because they have eight electrons in the outermost shells so they are stable enough forming little bonds or almost none but certain uh, compounds of the noble gases are also uh, reported now but other atoms they do not have a complete octet so they have lesser uh, than eight electrons in the outermost shell so each of these atoms uh, would try to complete it its octet in one way or the other right so this octet completion actually drives or compels these atoms to form bonds with other atoms now we'll come to the our main topic that is the types of chemical bonds so then these atoms can combine together uh, to form bonds in different ways we're not going to discuss all of them here but we'll be focusing on those which are quite relevant to uh, this course actually so the first type is the ionic bonds ionic bonds are the attractive forces between ions and that is why actually they are known as ionic bonds so it is the attractive force between ions and ions could be cations or anions cations are positively charged ions and anions are negatively charged ions i have told you earlier that a neutral atom has equal number of protons and electrons protons are positively charged electrons are negatively charged so an equal number of proton and electron means that there is no net charge on a particular atom it's only when an atom loses an electron in that case the number of electron reduces and because the number of protons is the same so when it loses an electron in that case the number of protons are greater than the number of electrons and it gets a positive charge on the other hand if a neutral atom gains an electron 
So initially, because it was neutral, it had equal number of protons and electrons, and now it gains one electron. So the number of negative charges increase as compared to that of the positive charges. So the net charge on that species then is a negative charge, and we call that an anion. So when we have cations, positive charges, ions or anions, negative ions, they attract each other and that attractive force compels them to form bonds which we call ionic bonds. So the formation of cation or anion from an atom depends on various factors. What does it mean? Which atom will preferably form a cation and which atom will form an anion. Obviously, the ionic bond is formed between the cation and the anion. But what will decide which atom is going to lose an electron and which atom is going to gain an electron in that process? So it depends upon different factors. And one factor, major factor, is the completion of the octet. And we will discuss this, explain this, with the help of an example, which is on the next slide. So here is an example of the formation of an ionic bond. So we have a nucleus which has 11 protons and 12 neutrons. So by now, I think you have an idea which element or which atom I am talking about. So when this nucleus has 11 protons, it should also have 11 electrons. And these 11 electrons are then distributed into different shells or orbitals. And you already know that we have a K shell, L shell and so on, or we have an S orbital in the K shell. And S orbital, as you know, can only accommodate two electrons. So the first shell will have two electrons. The second shell has S and P orbitals. So S can accommodate two, P can accommodate six. So we have a total of eight electrons in the second shell. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. We have eight electrons in the second shell. Now, because we can have a total of 11 electrons uh, so as to have a neutral atom, we already have 10 in this structure. So we cannot uh, fill the last electron in this shell because it can have a maximum of eight. It cannot have the ninth electron. So the next electron or the last electron should go into the next higher energy level and it will be present here all alone. And now you know that this is a sodium atom. It has 11 protons and 11 electrons revolving around the nucleus distributed in three shells. The first one has two, the second eight and the third one has one electron. As I already told you that it is the formation of an, uh, a complete octet that drives an atom to form a bond. Now you can see here that sodium has only one electron in the outermost shell. It, it wants to have a complete octet or in other words it wants to have eight electrons in the outermost shell. So you know here it has only one electron in the outermost shell. So to complete its octet, it needs seven more electrons. So to add seven electrons to this sodium atom is quite a tedious process and a very difficult one. A simpler way to have a complete octet is that this sodium loses one of its electron and that electron obviously would be the one that is farthest from the nucleus 
So this electron in green is lost happily by sodium and what is left behind is a nucleus with the same number of protons and neutrons that is not disturbed and now we have two shells. The last shell is gone. Why it is gone? Because it does not exist anymore. Because it does not have any physical existence i have already told you it does not have any physical existence it is only present or it was only present here just because there was an electron here revolving in this particular energy level around this nucleus but when this electron is gone there is no uh, there's no meaning of drawing another shell around uh, this nucleus because there's no electron and it, it's not like a road that it will exist whether a car is moving on it or not but it's just because of the electron that was present there and when it is gone the electron is gone the shell is gone so now we have a total of 10 electrons revolving around the nucleus and the proton number is 11 so one positive charge is more than the negative charges and that is why we have a positive charge on sodium. So this is how cations are produced. So now I think you know why sodium prefers to form cation, not an anion, right? And what happened when it lost an electron? Now it has eight electrons in its outermost shell. So its outermost shell is complete. The octet is complete. It has eight electrons in its outermost shell and it looks happier now right on the other hand well if we say that why sodium doesn't form negative uh, ions or anions to form a negative charge it should have it should gain an electron so if it gains an electron in this neutral atom it will have two in the outermost shell again it will not be a complete octet but a neutral atom forming a negative charge is going from stability to instability then you have to add another electron which is quite difficult uh, to add in an anion uh, adding an electron to an anion is quite difficult uh, even if you can add uh, another electron to uh, have a double negative charge on that sodium then you have to add a third one so you have to add seven electrons consecutively to form a complete octet and that is quite difficult almost impossible so this other way is simpler so it loses an electron happily to form a complete octet and in this case it forms a cation now we have another uh, nucleus that has 17 protons and 18 neutrons and because it has 17 protons it should have 17 electrons as well to have a neutral atom and I think you know what I'm talking about it's chlorine so the first shell will have two electrons again the second shell will have eight so now we have a total of ten electrons and we need seven more so the third shell has seven electrons and this forms a neutral chlorine atom now to have a complete octet it should have eight electrons in the outermost shell here it has seven so it needs one more electron to complete its octet in this case it has equal number of protons and electrons so there is no net charge on chlorine but to complete its octet it has to gain one electron so the electron that was lost by sodium is gained by chlorine and now you see with the addition of this electron it has add eight electrons in the outermost shell its octet is complete but the total number of electrons now in this species is 18 the number of protons are 17 so there is one more electron than protons and that is why one more negative charge and that means this chlorine will have a minus one charge and now you know why chlorine will form an anion because it can easily gain one electron to have a negative charge 
rather than to lose seven electrons uh, to have an electronic configuration like this. So losing seven electrons is quite difficult for chlorine, but gaining one electron is easier to have a complete octet. So now we have cations and anions, and you know that opposite charges, they can attract each other. So the attractive force between them will form a molecule or a bond that, and as a result, we have sodium chloride. I hope you got it. The next type uh, of bond are the covalent bonds. Now, covalent bonds are not formed uh, because of the gain or loss of electrons. So there is no gaining or losing of electrons involved in the formation of covalent bonds, but these are formed due to mutual sharing of electrons. So the two atoms involved in the formation of a covalent bond do not lose an electron completely, but they are happy to share electrons between them. So no electron is completely lost or gained, but they are shared equally between two nuclei. So as an example, we have uh, this uh, atom, uh, which has one proton in the nucleus and no neutrons. So you know what I'm talking about. It's a hydrogen nucleus. And because it has one proton, it has one electron revolving around the uh, nucleus. When this hydrogen comes closer to another hydrogen, See, this hydrogen has only one shell and you know that the first shell has only S orbital and S orbital can accommodate only two electrons. So in this case, uh, we will not be talking about octet completion, but uh, this is an exception uh, for hydrogen that we have to complete its duplet because it has only one shell and the first shell can have two electrons so it will be stable when it has two electrons around its nucleus it cannot have eight electrons so when it comes closer to another hydrogen this hydrogen also has one electron in its outermost shell so it will not lose or gain electrons similarly this hydrogen will not lose or gain electron each of them require only one electron to complete their duplet so as to have two electrons in the outermost shell. So what they do is that they share their single electrons between them and these two electrons lie right in the center at equal distance from the two nuclei. So now you see that both these nuclei under the, are under the influence of both the nuclei. These two electrons are under the influence of this nucleus as well as under the influence of this nucleus because they are right in the center of these two nuclei. So this nucleus has a complete duplet. This nucleus also has a complete duplet. Both are happy and we have a covalent bond formed between two hydrogen atoms. And we can represent it with this structure formula uh, showing dots between uh, two atoms and this type of structure is known as the Lewis structure of a molecule. So from two hydrogen atoms we form a hydrogen molecule H2 by sharing of the single electrons. Now covalent bonds uh, could be of different types. The first one is a single covalent bond. So if the two atoms that are involved in covalent bond formation share one electron pair between them, we have a single covalent bond. Examples of such type of bonds are those present in hydrogen H2, in fluorine F2, and in methane CH4. You can also have other examples which have single covalent bonds. 
So when two electrons or one electron pair is shared between two atoms to form a covalent bond, we say that they have a single covalent bond between them. Let's see this with an example. So again, we have two hydrogens, each having one electron in their atoms, and they are happy to share these single electrons with each other to form a hydrogen molecule. And we represent this sharing of one electron pair with a single straight line. Then we have F2. So we have fluorine, which has seven electrons in its outermost shell. So one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And you already know that it would like to uh, complete its octet. So again, it depends whether it will form an anion like chlorine in the last case, or it will share its electron with another atom. So that depends uh, which atom is it uh, going to form a bond with. So if it has another fluorine closer to it, which also has seven electrons in its outermost shell, it will be happy to share one electron between themselves. So now this fluorine, has eight electrons you see both of these electrons are under the influence of both the fluorines so two and plus six it has eight electrons and two plus six this fluorine also has eight electrons then we have an example of methane methane has a carbon atom and four hydrogens attached to it Carbon belongs to the fourth group in the periodic table. So it has four electrons in its outermost shell. And you can see these four electrons right here. One, two, three, four. So to complete its octet, it needs four electrons. And these four electrons are provided by the four hydrogen atoms. <clears throat> so each of these hydrogen atom provides one electron and share its one electron with one electron of the carbon atom. So on each side, one hydrogen atom shares one of its uh, or its only electron with the carbon atom to form four single covalent bonds and we have a methane molecule. So this is how single covalent bonds are produced. What is a double covalent bond? So if the two atoms, they share two pairs of electrons, like in the case of oxygen or C2H4 or ethylene, then we say that atoms have a double covalent bond. So if two electron pairs are shared between two atoms, the bond formed is a double covalent bond. We'll see this with the help of these examples. So we have an oxygen which has six electron in its outermost shell. The other four are not shown here because uh, they're not involved in bond formation. So we only have uh, two electrons from this oxygen and two electrons from this oxygen which are involved in bond formation. In fact, oxygen belongs to the sixth group of the periodic table. So it has six electrons in its outermost shell. Two are shown here, four others are not shown. And so four plus two, six, and the two shared by this oxygen makes eight for this oxygen. Again, four here, two here, six, and two shared by this oxygen makes it a complete octet for this oxygen as well. And now because we have two electron pairs, we will draw a double line between the two oxygen atoms and we call it a double covalent bond. Let's see this in case of ethylene. So we have two carbon atoms. One carbon has four electrons in its outermost shell. So this carbon, which belongs to the fourth group of the periodic table, has four electrons in its outermost shell. The second carbon also has four electrons in its outermost shell. Now in this case, 
these two carbon atoms they share two electrons with each other so actually two pairs of electrons are shared with each other so now you can count the number of electrons present with each carbon atom this carbon initially had four blue electrons two shared these orange sh electrons shared by this carbon makes it a total of six electrons with this carbon atom this carbon had initially four orange electrons two blue electrons shared by this carbon makes it six for this carbon as well and because you know that these atoms they form bonds to complete their octet now none of these two carbon atoms have a complete octet each of them have six electrons uh, closer to them they would like to have two more this carbon as well as this carbon would like to have two more electrons and those two electrons are provided by two hydrogen atoms for each of these carbon atoms so two hydrogens for one carbon and two hydrogens for the other carbon provide two electrons to each of them and so this carbon now has one two three four five six seven and eight electrons so its octet is complete two electrons shared by two hydrogens with this carbon makes it one two three four five six seven and eight electrons for this carbon so now you see that both the carbon atoms have a complete octet on the other hand there are four hydrogens as well and you know that the hydrogens must have a complete duplet you see this hydrogen has two electrons now because one is shared from the by the carbon one is its own uh, electron so it has two its duplet is complete this hydrogen has two its duplet is complete this has a complete duplet and this also has a complete duplet now all of the atoms have complete octets and duplets so it's a stable neutral molecule and we represent it with this Lewis structural formula. So there's a double line between the two carbon atoms, which we call the double covalent bond. And because only one electron pair is shared between the carbon and the hydrogens, we have a single line between carbon and hydrogens because that is a single covalent bond. Only the two carbon atoms have a double covalent bond between them. Then we have a triple covalent bond. So if there is a sharing of three electron pairs between two atoms, then we say there is a triple bond between them. Examples are nitrogen and C2H2 or acetylene. You can also have other examples for triple covalent bonds, but we'll discuss these two examples here right now. So nitrogen that belongs to the fifth group of the periodic table has five electrons in its outermost shell if it comes closer to another nitrogen which also has five electrons in its outermost shell so each of these nitrogens need three more electrons because they have five so they need three more to complete their octet so they would like to share three electrons with each other so sharing three pairs of electrons means that this nitrogen now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight electrons. And sharing three pairs of electrons uh, from this nitrogen means that this nitrogen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight electrons. So both the nitrogens have a complete octet, and we draw three lines between the two nitrogen atoms, meaning there is a triple covalent bond between them. Now we come to the two uh, carbon atoms in acetylene so again each of the carbon atom both belong to the group four they, so they will have four electrons in the outermost shell orange for one carbon and these blue electrons for the other carbon now in this case these two carbon atoms they share three electron pairs so three electron pairs are shared between the three carbon between the two carbon atoms so this carbon has a total of six plus one seven electrons and this carbon also has a total of six plus one seven electrons so none of them have a complete octet each of them requires one more electron 
and that one electron is provided by one hydrogen each to the two carbon atoms. So a hydrogen sh shares one of its electron with the, each of these carbon atoms. So now each carbon has eight electrons and each hydrogen has two electrons. So the duplets and the octets are complete in acetylene and we represent it in such a form. Now you would say why in uh, ethylene uh, there was a uh, sharing of two electron pairs while in acetylene there is sharing of three electron pairs. What is the reason or why it is so? So we will discuss that in our next lecture maybe. Uh, in the next video I will tell you uh, why this happens or what is the reason behind this. So this is all for today. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for joining. See you later.